this morning. Romans chapter number three, if you guys will. We're going to go back into verse number 25 um, and uh, one more time here and look at that issue of propitiation. Uh, let's start reading in verse 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Our redemption is based upon someone else's activity, the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we looked at, we introduced that last time. Uh, again, each word is important to understand the issue of justified, the issue of freely, the issue of His grace, the issue of redemption. Because as we come in now to verse 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remissions of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. And really, we'll uh, look at one more time at the beginning of that verse, and then next week we'll move on down. Um, ver he, whom? In whom? Whom? In the Lord Jesus Christ. God set forth. He put Him on open display, public display. No secret, nothing hidden, no mystery to it. And uh, it, rather, he, it is simple. It's understandable. It's knowable. It's believable. It's right there. It's right across, uh, you know, baseball's back. And so it's right across belt, he, lot, he, uh, belt uh, waist high, um, 80 miles an hour, fastball, slow ball, so you can hit it out of the park, you know. Uh, a couple years ago, well, several years ago, I was watching Sammy Sosa and Doug, uh, Mark McGuire run for the home run, and uh, they were doing the home run derby. And the guy just kept putting the ball right in the middle, right in the sweet spot, and out they go. You know, And that's what the Lord's done. That's what God's done. That's what the Godhead has done. And uh, he put it on display. He set it forth. And a propitiation through faith in his blood. And what I, I want to do this morning with you, with that issue of propitiation, uh, develop that out of a... a, a, a a Bible definition will be that issue of a fully satisfying payment. And as we go down through and as we begin to look at this, we've seen the faith of Christ. And in verse 25, you now see the faith of the Father and the transaction that happened between the Father and the Son. And I said it last time, the propitiation here. This is an activity between God the Father and God the Son. You and I are not in this equation. If we were, we'd, it, we'd mess it up. Okay? Now, He's doing it on our behalf. The same, the God of the uh, righteousness of God that condemned the sinner. We've seen chapter 1, 2, and 3, first part of 3. Now that righteousness is saying, look, sinner, sit there, sit down, be quiet, and pay attention to what I have done for you. And as the Savior enters the courtroom, he says, I'm going to take your sentence and I'm going to put it on him, and he's going to take care of it. He's going to be the guilty. Who, should have, who is the guilty? We are. Man is. But I'm going to give the sentence to him. So as we go down through this morning, this issue of propitiation, I want you to, hopefully, it becomes very personal for you. And... Uh, it's something that we need to be touched by. There, there are several doctrines that are going on in the doctrine of propitiation. You have the doctrine of imputation, the doctrine of identification, the doctrine of, sub, of substitute. And you've got all of these different doctrines, and Paul kind of balls them all up in one word. Because this doctrine is designed to have an impact on our lives. Because he not only paid the sin penalty... But then he took care of sin completely and totally. So yes, it saves us from the lake of fire and from hell, but then it also sets us free now in life to go live for him. And as we get over in Romans 6, in, in Romans 6, your sanctification, your walk, is built upon the foundation of propitiation. Okay? Because the propitiation, the issue of him satisfying the payment taking care of the payment completely, then allows you and I over here to live a life where we're not under the dominion. Sin will, shall not have dominion over you. Why? 
Because we live in this propitiation environment, in this grace environment where he did it. So this doctrine is very important. That's why Linda's like, you're going to go over one more? I go, yeah, because it's important to grasp as we now move forward in the book of Romans. Come over with me to Hebrews 9. We, we were kind of here at the end of last week, and I want to pick up here Hebrews chapter number 9. Hebrews 9, and uh, the, the issue here in Hebrews 9, uh, Christ is the uh, verse 11, Hebrews 9 verse 11, where uh, the writer of Hebrews is talking about Christ being a high priest, verse 11, but Christ being a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. So you have this issue here of Christ being this tabernacle, okay? He's going to be the high priest. Now, go back up, in the ver- up, up above that to verse number uh, 6. Well, let's make it 5. That's where I'm looking for. And over it, the cherubs of, of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot, we cannot now speak particularly, now, when these things were thus ordained, the priests were always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of his people. That issue there of the mercy seat. And again, that Greek word is the same Greek word as propitiation, so everybody you know, that likes to run the Greek stuff and gets all, up, gets all you know, bound up in that. But the thing is, is the mercy seat and propitiation, they're two different words, and they're two different ideas. The propitiation is looking for, you remember last time, the person, okay? The Lord Jesus Christ, the person, he's the source. But the mercy seat is the place. Where are they? Where is the mercy seat at? Well, it sits on top of the Ark of the Covenant, that box, the coffin. It's got Aaron's rod and uh, a thing uh, there in verse 4. It's got uh, um, uh, the tablets and the manna. That's the word I was looking for. (laughs) And it sits in there, okay? And then they put a lid on it, and then they put these cherubs on it. And between the cherubs is where the presence of the Lord's going to be, the Shekinah glory is going to be. But that priest goes in how many times? Once a year, he takes that blood of the bull, sprinkles himself. How many times? Do you remember? Seven, not six, not eight. You know what he does? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> Was it seven? Oh, well, one more just for good luck. If he did it, he's dead. It's instant death, and they drag, have to go drag him out. Then he goes and gets the blood for his people. Then he goes in how many times? Seven times. And he puts that blood on that mercy seat. What's in the coffin, by the way? The broken law. Israel has broken the law, so when the, when the father looks down, what does he see? Not the broken law, he sees the blood of the sacrifice. But he had to do that every year, didn't he? J- Jesus Christ, he's our propitiation. Paul, uh, we looked last time about he's our Passover. Or maybe we're going to look at it today. I don't know. We'll get there. It's going to come either way. Uh, da, 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 da. No, we did it last time. Okay? <laughs> so when you have that issue going on, so our propitiation, our mercy seat, if you will, is Calvary. That's, where, that's why we have to be in Christ, in the activity. And that, that's what we're getting to. Now, down in verse 11, Christ has become the high priest. And he's going to, now he's, it's very, to me it's so fascinating when you put this stuff together. The Lord dies. He's buried three days. He's resurrected. He looks at those ladies and says, you can't touch me. I have to be i got to go do my father's business. And he leaves. And he goes up into the tabernacle in the, hev- in the third heaven. And it's, it's as if you will, he crawled up on the mercy seat and said, 
I am the sacrifice. That's what he's talking about in verse 11. But Christ being a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and of calves, but by his own blood. He entered in, notice now, once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. How many times is he going to do this? One time. And it's not the tabernacle on the earth. It's the tabernacle where? In the heaven. The building not made with hands. The perfect tabernacle. Where is that? It's not here. It's not Moses. It's up there in the third heaven. Then he goes in verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkle Sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For this, for, for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. His, Jesus Christ is the foundation of the New Covenant. But what about Jesus Christ is that foundation, the shedding of his blood, okay? So Jesus Christ becomes, and I know this is talking about Israel and their program, but the same is applying to you and I. What did he do? Again, I, I, I want this to, I, I, I was sitting there last night thinking about it and going, man, I, you need to see the transaction that's happening between the Son and the Father, because he did it for us as well. And these verses describe that. Verse, uh, drop down to verse 22. Or, or, well, uh, yeah, verse 22. And almost all things are by the law purged with what? Blood. And without shedding of blood, there uh, is no remission. I, I threw that there in there, sorry. And without shedding of blood is no remission. What is needed to have the remission? The shedding of blood. Verse 25. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as a high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. The, fa the Son has become what? The sacrifice. And the Father has made Him to be that sacrifice. And He's made Him to be our sacrifice. It, 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 if you come over to 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 5, it, it, it's our eternal life is built upon, it hinges upon this truth. Of, of propitiation, the fact of he's that perfect sacrifice. You remember Israel's Passover. They were to pull that lamb out, an innocent lamb. But he had to be what? Perfect, without spot, without blemish. They watched it, and then they kill it. Then they roasted it and ate it. And they took that blood and they put it on the doorpost. The Passover, the death angel comes. What went on? The doorpost is what saved them. Think about the Ark of the Covenant. What was on the top of the lid? The blood. Everything inside that Ark was secure. Everything inside the door, behind the door was secure. Why? Because they had that shed blood of an innocent one on there. You and I aren't innocent. We're guilty. We're not in the equation here at all. By the way, nor was the nation of Israel when he did it. And back there in Exodus with that Passover, they were guilty. They, were, they come out as a mixed multitude. What did I tell you? 2 Corinthians 5. Look at verse 21. So propitiation has everything to do with God, who in his love did for us what we could not do for ourselves. It is not God's loving us. It's what He did. 
whom, uh, Romans 5, 8. But God commended his love towards who? Us. He did this activity over here and said, now I'm going to apply it to the guilty. And I'm going to make it unto all and upon all them that believe. He became the redemptive payment. He's the soul savior. I listened, I heard that song the other day, Soul Sister, you know. He's the soul savior. He's the only savior. That's who he is. Look at 2 Corinthians 5 and look at verse 21. Well, I guess we are going to see this. Anyway, we're ahead. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. There's a, come back with me to Isaiah 53. There's a transaction between the Father and the Son to accomplish this. And we'll start here in Isaiah 53. That transaction between the Father and the Son demonstrates the faithfulness of both individual members of the Godhead. And actually, the Holy Spirit's there, so His as well. Because in 322, we saw the faith of Christ, but in 325, we see the faith of who? The Father in His sacrifice in his blood. So you're seeing not only the faith of the Son to do the will and the word of the Father and to go and do it, not my will, but thy will, but now we see the faith of the Father to say, I laid the plan out, so I'm going to accomplish the plan because you did what your part, I will do my part. And there's where the propitiation comes in, where it's it's satisfying the justice of God. The justice of God says you have to have perfect righteousness. The Son had it. He was made to be sin who knew no sin. He he didn't know sin, but he was made sin. We're going to see this in just a minute. And when he did that, the justice of God says now you get resurrection in eternal life. Because you did what? You did what was required. I want us to see that transaction between the Father and the Son. Because you think about the Son. (laughs) He comes out of that wonderful environment of heaven and the Godhead and and, uh, glory. And he comes down here to the old stinking earth and becomes part of the human race. And when he did, he came down, born of a... A virgin was a babe, takes on full humanity. If he's 100% humanity, you know what he got? He got a body, he got a soul, and he got a spirit. He's God, but he also got those three. Just as you and I have it, he had it. That's why he can say, as in all points common to man, I was tempted in all points, just like man was. Those three areas there. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. All laid before him. They were all laid there before him, by the way, in Matthew 4 and Luke 4, in the temptation of Christ by by Satan there. Isaiah 53, again, contextually, dispensationally, this is Israel. If you look there, um, verse 8, he was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the la- he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. Well, who's the my people? Israel. So contextually, you, this is about Israel. He's come to save his people from their sins. But what I want you to see here is you begin to see the transaction between the father and the son. Verse ten. Yet it pleased the Lord, Jehovah here, to bruise him. Well, who would the him be? That's Jesus Christ. So who's the Lord? Capital L-O-R-D. That's Jehovah the Father. Okay? So Jehovah the Father, it pleased him to bruise his son. He hath put him to grief. 
Think about that. He put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand, and he shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. And there's the biblical definition of propitiation, satisfied. There it is. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Notice in verse 10, it pleased the Lord. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt, notice that word, make his soul an offering. That word make, over in 2 Corinthians 5, that word made. Make. That's the doctrine of imputation. There's a transformation going to happen here. The father is going to take his son out of a natural environment and put him in an unnatural environment. Sin. Think about that. The Godhead, he was perfect humanity, no sin. He's God, no sin. And what did the father do to him? Made him sin. Made him, the father offering his son to, by the way, he's offering his son to himself. He's not offering his son to you. He did it for himself and to himself. The, verse 11, the travail of his soul. Boy, we're going to see how he suffered. But yet, he, and he shall be what? Satisfied. That all-sufficient, all-satisfying sacrifice that was offered up for our sins, for, for the sins of humanity. And the concept of propitiation there is that he became our sacrifice. And it satisfied the justice. It satisfied the holiness of God. 1 Corinthians, hold on, slip something in Isaiah, go to 1 Corinthians 5, slip something in Psalms 22, we'll get there in just a minute, 1 Corinthians 5, look at verse 7, watch, this theme of Him being our sacrifice, it's all through the book of Romans, by the way, and, it's all, and it flows through 2 Corinthians, Paul's epistles as well. There's a scarlet thread that runs all the way through Scripture. Starts in Genesis 3, verse 15, and it just is laid there. And you know what? It's, it's not prominent. Doesn't shine. You know, what color did uh, Rahab, what color was she a work? What color did she put out the window? Do you remember? Scarlet. What was, you know, you got different things like that all through Scripture. You just see this issue of the sacrifice. The propitiation. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, Paul here, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you, have, as you are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is what? Sacrificed for us. But He's Christ, our what? Passover. See, he's got that, that, whole, that theme, that idea from Israel's program of He's our Passover. Look at what he did. He did it for us. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. I, I hope I'm, you know, I just, I think about this and you begin to fall in love with your Savior all over again for what he's going through and going to do for you. Ephesians 5 verse 21. I'm sorry, Ephesians 5 verse 1. Be ye therefore the followers of God, as your dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Isn't that a... Wow! What did he do? There's a transaction between the Father and the Son, and the Son went and did it, and it's a sweet-smelling savor. 2 Corinthians 5. We were just there just a minute ago. We'll come back to that passage. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. 
2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. So as we look this morning and the rest of our time in Isaiah and Psalms, don't think Paul isn't picking up on this and bringing it into us because he died how many times? Once. But he died for all. Okay? 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us. Made. Isaiah 53, make. There's an abnor abnormal transformation happening here. And it happens on the cross. He's no sin. We're going to see in Psalms 22 where he's going to beg for help, cry for help. And the Father turns a deaf ear to him. Why? Because he's sin. The Father made him to be our Passover, our sacrifice. Made him to be sin. <laughs> Jesus Christ is sin. That's that three hours of darkness on the cross there. Not only was the sun blotted out, but there was the darkness of the adversary and of the, of the battle that was raging. And we've talked about that in other studies. And he did it for who? For us. Boy, what wonderful, glorious truth there. What a wonderful transformation. <laughs> but he made, and then he that we might be made. Again, made. I, 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 that word made just strikes me. Made, not, not our righteousness, but made the righteousness of God. You think about, think about you and I. Here we are. We're low-down, dirty, rotten skunks, scoundrels, lower than a snake's belly in a wagon rut, Dad would say, you know, used to say. Probably still does, Okay. You go to Calvary, and you become a, a, a saint of the Most High God, don't you? But Paul says, you know what you became? You became a new man. You became a new creature. Your natural status is this mess over here, but he made you the righteousness of God. He, made, he took you out of your natural, and he did something unnatural with you. That's why he calls you a new creation, a new creature, a new man. People stumble over those terms all the time. But it's not that it's not there anything new about humanity. It's been going on since day one or day six, sorry. Okay. It's what did he do with you? He took, he made you. He came and he said, I'm gonna make a unnatural event happen here and I'm going to give them and I'm going to make them complete I'm going to give them my righteousness that's fantastic come back to Isaiah 53 that's, that is wonderful I like it too but it sits in that word made make see and if you're not paying attention we just read over those words and oh we're made the righteousness of God in him Woohoo! yay no, man, what did he do? The transaction that takes place, not only between the Father and the Son, but then you, when you come to the Son, and the Father says, I'm going to bless you with all, I'm going to make you this in Christ, he's taking, an un he's taking you out of your natural element and putting you into an unnatural scenario. That's why I want this to become personal for you. And not just ah, propitiation, and we got to this and move on. Isaiah 53, look at verse 10 again. Yet it pleased the, the Lord, it pleased him. It pleased him to do what? To bruise him. Make him. Make his soul suffering. Suffer. It pleased him. Now, back up in verse 3. It is, it, it, uh, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. He, he, the end of verse 2, he hath no for, uh, former, uh, form, form nor comeliness 
and when we saw him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Boy, he wasn't walking around like a Superman Jesus pictures, you see. He's just walking around like a common, everyday Jewish man. That's the physical stuff. Marred him, bruised him, went under the scourge of the Romans, battered him. That's the physical. By the way, it pleased him to do that, to bruise him. But now watch verse 10. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper. See, there's a, not only is there the physical marring, but now also there is this, this pleasure in bruising his soul. Your soul, that very, your very identity, who you are. <laughs> uh, you know, you think about that. Who was he? So we're not talking here now about the physical issues. We're now we're talking about the soul, the stuff inside. By the way, no physical object could ever atone for sin. You know how you know that? Hebrews 9 just told you, for the blood of bulls and goats didn't do it. No, nothing physical ever atoned for sin. He did. His identity is where the transformation happens. Verse 11, Isaiah 53, 11, He shall see of the travail of his soul. That soul is offered. And again, it's offered for the many. It's offered for Israel here. But then you and I, we understand from Paul in 1 Timothy 2 that it moved from many to how many? All. Who would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge. He gave himself a ransom for all, 1 Timothy 2, 6. See? So, the scene here. Now, come over. Look at verse 11. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their... And by his knowledge, there's the faithfulness of Christ. We've talked about that a couple weeks ago. Now come over to Psalms 22, and for the rest of the morning, I want you to see the travail of his soul. I want you to see this. Because this, the son knows what the father is thinking. He knows his plan, his purpose. And the father is going to watch his son perform and to do. And he writes it in Psalms 22. There's a wonderful title at the top of Psalms 22, the chief, of, uh, chief musician upon... I jello shahar, a psalm of David. You know, you should pay attention to those. That alahar, shazar, it means the hind of the morning is what that means. Who's the morning star? That's Christ. Sun, the sun rising in the morning brings the heat, the sun of righteousness. When does the sun rise? S-U-N. In the morning, what does he bring in? Healing in his wings, Malachi 4. When he shows up, it's daylight. When he goes away, it's what? Darkness. Okay? The son of the morning. Here he is. Now, Psalms 22, <clears throat> notice, just, notice verse 20, just real quick before we get into it. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save him from... The lion's mouth. You see that? Deliver my soul. That's what we're going to be looking at. By the way, the, the, my darling, that is another way to describe his soul. If you come over to chapter 35 of Psalms, hold on to 22. Got to catch these things. 35, verse 17. Lord, how long wilt thou look on? Rescue my soul from their destruction, my darling from the lions. Again, soul and darling connected. Come over to 69. Psalm 69. Hold on to 22. There's just so much here. Psalm 69, 
Verse 1, save me, O God, for the waters are come in unto my soul. Verse 18, draw near unto my, I'm sorry, draw nigh unto my soul and redeem it. Deliver me because of mine enemies. And what he's describing in 69 Starting there in verse 1, and you go down, and you see him, I sink in the deep mire, verse 2, where there is no standing. I am come into the deep waters, where the floods overflow me. I am weary of my crying, my throat is dry. They hate me without a cause, are more than the hairs of mine head. I've become a reproach. Come back to Psalms 22. He's describing his soul going down and dealing with the issue of the second death and death and what it's going to what it feels like for someone who is a sinner because he's been made to be sin he says you know what the sinner feels this is what sinner feels in death this is what death feels like and it's like a pit in the mire and the water crashing in on them I don't know if you've ever drowned before. Well, you're here, so I guess you haven't, you know. But it's not exactly a pleasant feeling. It's scary. It overwhelms you. I watched a movie for about two minutes, and it was called Buried Alive. I shouldn't have watched it to begin with. I don't do good with those movies because then I have nightmares for weeks, you know. But, you know, they're when they go bury the guy and they stick a two, and I'm like, dude, forget it. I'm in anxiety already. Click, click. Let's go watch Mary Poppins or something, you know. <laughs> That's what happens here. Come back to Psalms 22. On the cross, when he is made to be sin, those three hours of darkness there. By the way, the Lord, he speaks only seven times from the cross. He never bowed his head. He's been, I mean, just beaten to a pulp. He's got his hand stretched out, nailed. His head is erect the whole time. He's in conscious thinking about the Word of God. Then he says seven times, his little seven sayings, to fulfill the Scripture. And he's sitting there at the very end. And he's going through the Psalms. And you know what he says? Oh, there's one over there where they, I, they got to give me something to drink. They wanted to give him gall in the beginning. It was like a morphine-type sedative to ease the pain, and he refused it when you read the record. There's a reason. He wanted his mind clear about what was happening. Again, he knows what the Father's been thinking and what he's going through. He goes through those three hours of difference, comes out on the other side, the, the battle. Where Isaiah 40, uh, 2, 49, somewhere over in there. And he says, who is my... Who's going to stand with against me? Who, where's the contender? Bring him on. Bring on the adversary. Put him up. Let's go at it. And they go in, and that conflict of the ages comes out raging. He gets to the end of it, and he says, I thirst. And they go over, and they get him the gall and the vinegar, and they give it to him. And then he says, it is finished, and bows his head and gives up the ghost. He's not sitting up there as a wounded man, just, oh. He's sitting there at, coming out of that transformation of where the Father makes him to be sin, and he pays the second death for, for all of humanity. And you know what he says? My God, my God, verse 1, 22, 1, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Why are you rejecting me? Why are you forsaking me? He's crying for help. Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. I'm crying, help, 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 and there's no response. The doors of heaven have slammed shut. The intercoms turned off. The phones are disconnected. By the way, he's going to answer it in verse 3. But anytime you ever see, okay, why did he do that? Just keep reading. He'll tell you. But thou art holy. Habakkuk 1 says that a holy God cannot, is, has pure eyes and can't look on sin. 
2 Corinthians 6, Paul says, What union hath the unrighteousness with righteous? What communion? What fellowship? None. When he cries, my God, why are you forsaking me? Why isn't the Father listening to him? Because he's been made sin. And the Holy God can't look on sin. He's holy. He's sitting there going, uh, uh, Habakkuk 1, I give you the verse, sorry. Hold on to Psalms 22. Habakkuk 1. Verse 12 and 13, but verse 13, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. And he just called him, in verse 12, the Holy One. And in Psalms 22, as Christ hangs there, and that transaction is happening between the faith of the Father and the faith of the Son, and the plan is being executed, the, the plan of redemption... He says, where are you? Why aren't you paying attention to me? Look at verse 8, Psalms 22, verse 8. 22, 8. He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Where are you? Verse 11. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. No help. Where are you, Father? Verse 19, 22, 19. But be thou not thou, I'm sorry, be not thou, but be not thou far from me, O Lord. O my strength, has, haste thee to help me deliver my soul. The, the transaction between the Father and the Son is the Son is being, has been made sin the object, and what the Father is dealing with is the object, not His Son. His Son is, okay, as in God, but because He has now been made the object, which is sin. Hold on to Psalms 22 and get 69, Psalm 69. By the way, well, Psalm 69, I'll give it away here, verse 13. Psalm 69, 13. But as for me, my prayer is unto thee, O Lord, in an acceptable time, O God. In the multitude of thy mercy, hear me in the truth of thy salvation. Look at what the Son says to the Father. And you know what the Father says? Here's the Father's thinking. I told you, Son, in the acceptable time. That's the resurrection. I'll deliver you. Right now on the cross, no deliverance. Right now on Calvary, you are, you are the object. You, you're being made sin. There's a transaction, a transformation being made here from your naturally who you are into an unnatural condition. And that's called sin. And I can't deliver you from that. But in... The acceptable time, the day of resurrection, which was how many days later? Three days later, good to go. That's the Father's thinking. That's what the Son knows. That's why the Son says, verse 13, my prayer is, my prayer is, Father, you remember the acceptable time. <laughs> I'm doing this, and I'm counting on you to do that. Verse 16, 69, 16, Hear me, O Lord, for thy loving kindness is good. Turn unto me according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Hide not thy face from thy servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speedily. Go back to Psalms 22. Man, the sun is hanging there. 100% humanity, his soul in travail. And he says, Father, hear me. And the Father has turned off the intercom. Because his son, he has made him to be sin. The propitiation. 22.4, it's fascinating. Again, Christ is hanging there. The first 20. 20, uh, 21 verses are about his suffering on the cross. 
verse 22 to the end of the chapter then is about his glory in the kingdom because of his suffering on the cross. <laughs> verse 4. I, watch what he does. Watch what you think you and I pull the guilt trip every now and then. Watch what the son's doing here. Again, he knows the father's thinking. He's erect. He, he's, he's got it. But man, what's going on inside? He's looking for relief. Verse 4, our fathers trusted in thee, and, and uh, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. But I, wait a minute, Father, you did it for them. You delivered them. Why aren't you delivering me? They messed up. They did what you told them to do, and they were... But what's, my, what's wrong with me? Well, verse 6 is what's wrong with him. But I'm a what? I'm a worm and no man. A reproach of men and despised of the people. I'm a worm. I am, I am that Isaiah 66, the end of that passage, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Mark 9. I am, he has been, when he says I'm a worm... That worm issue describes the degenerative nature of sin. Lucifer was the most beautiful creature in all of God's universe. And he ends up being described as the devil. A dragon. Leviathan. A sea monster. The serpent. You know what he did? He went from honor and glory to the mud puddle. You know what? Man does the same thing. Romans 1, we've seen it. They deglorified God, and God then, de and because of that, then they are deglorified in themselves. There's an honor and glory that God gave the man. And he says, I am but a worm. Think about that as he saw the travail of his soul. His father saw his son. The perspective of the Holy One, the Holy God on sin. I'm a worm. I don't know, that's pretty tough. Verse 7. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake their head saying... He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. They're going to slander him now. They're going to shout at him. They're going to mock him. And he says, Lord, they're sitting there saying that I said that you were, the Father was going to deliver me, and you're not delivering me. So they're going to, they look up at him and they say, if you be the king, come on down off of there. And, he, and I can't do it because I'm a worm. I'm not there yet. Look at what they're doing to me. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make my, me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's breast. He goes back and he remembers the tender moments of his youth. You ever hear people say that when they go to, before they die, their life flashes before their minds and their thinking? There it is. He's remembering the tender moments of his life. Be not far, verse 11, from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Man, nobody's helping him. Bulls. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have Beset me round. The leaders of Israel are marching by and mocking him, and they've circled him. They're the spokes, bulls of Bashan. Bashan is a, the Baal worship, and it's another name for, 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 the devil, for Satan, the adversary. And you know what? The leadership of Israel have become his spokesmen, and they've circled around him. They gape upon me with their mouth as a ravening and, and a roaring lion. 
I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, and is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaveth to, the jaw, to my jaws. Thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Look at that, the physicalness going on. He is so wiped out physically. And then he says, For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. By the way, that's the only way you know is that verse, that they pierced his hands and his feet. By the way, in Isaiah 53, the only way you know they plucked their beard is that verse in Isaiah 53. They pierced the dogs. Who are the dogs? The Gentiles. Verse 21. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorn. The lion's mouth. Who is that? Who's the lion? The adversary. Verse 20. Deliver my soul from the sword. Oh, man, who's the sword? Come over to Zechariah uh, 13. Zechariah 13. Man, you look at who's against him here. Zechariah 13. Zechariah 13, verse 6. Folks, this is the transaction between the Father and the Son, where the faith of the Son said, Father, I got faith in your plan that you will get it done. Get her done. And I'm going to go and do it. And I've got faith that on that third day you will resurrect me. And the Father says, here's the plan. Boom, on the third day, I'll resurrect you. And the Spirit says, I'm a witness to all of it, and I'll help in the resurrection too. Because he does. He's there. And he goes, all right, we're going to... And then he goes to Calvary. He's in the garden, and he sees the cup. Father, not my will, but thy will. What was his will? Not to go through what he saw. Not to go through with the plan. But the Father's will, so we're going to go do that. Now he's hanging there. Zechariah 13, look at verse 6. And one shall, Zechariah 13, 6, And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thy hands? Then he shall answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. That's the Father speaking. Who's the sword? The Father. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn my hand upon the little ones. That's the Father. On the cross, you know what the Father knew? That what He was doing was for the little ones. What He was going through was for my people and the many. But the sword did what? Come back to Psalms 22. The sword did the smiting, didn't it? The sword, the father, smote him. He has his hands out, spread his hands out. They're pierced. So in Psalms 22, as Christ hangs on the cross, as our propitiation that we now know through the revelation given to the Apostle Paul, As he hangs there, the Father is against him. Satan is against him. The nation of Israel is against him. And the dogs, the Gentiles, are against him. No wonder he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I'm alone. There is no help. What does he do? He dies. He's completely rejected. Come back to Romans 3. He comes through. For the wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is what happened on the third day. Up from the grave he arose. He's not here. Come and see where he laid. The angel said. You know why they rolled the stone back from the temple, from that tomb? 
was to prove that he was gone. It wasn't to get him out. He went up through the roof. Sometimes there's a thought that they rolled the tomb out so he could get out. <laughs> He's God. He, <laughs> he grew the tree that one day would, he would hang on Calvary <laughs> on. See. So in Romans 3, verse 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. That I hope you see the transaction that happened between the Father. You and I are not in Psalms 22 when he went through that. Psalm 69, the great reproach song where he goes down through and describes what death and going down into the pit and all that. But you know what he knew? He knew what the Father's plan was. And you know where his hope laid and rested? In the third day resurrection. His hope and his, his all that got him through it all was, you know what, my Father's word is good. And he's faithful to carry it out. So in, when he goes and he dies, again, death has, 1 Corinthians 15, man, he took care of death. Death has no victory anymore. It's been dealt with. And he did it on the cross. He's our propitiation. I hope you see the personal side of propitiation. So sometimes we get into this big theology or all this... No, there's such a... Folks, listen, don't you ever say or let anyone ever say that grace is cheap. It cost the son's life. It's not cheap. We get accused of easy believism. Uh -uh, none of this is easy. It costs the father. Could you imagine as a dad or as a mom... <laughs> As a parent, listening to your son or, sib or child crying for help, and you can't. Not that you didn't want to, but you can't. Because your word is that you won't. And then you can. The power, that exceeding power, we're going to talk about next hour in the heavenly places, and he set him. <laughs> Set him, put him forth, put him on display. So that personal side of propitiation, I hope you see that this morning. It's not something to go, oh yeah, you just easy believe, you guys just believe it and go and you can live any way you want to. No, 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 no. That's why First, Second Corinthians 5, he says, we thus judge that if one died, or all were dead and he died for all, that we should live for him. Why? Because yes, he did die and pay that sin penalty, but he died so that we could have the resurrection life and the newness of life and to go live life in that. And when people, oh, Rick, I struggle with sin. and I, Get out and quit thinking. You're not thinking about You don't know. You don't understand. You're not thinking properly through this. Look at what he did. And again, that's why I said earlier, the propitiation, his propitiation, his, the deal between him and the, the Father and the Son impacts every aspect of our life. Sets us free from the dominion of sin sets us free from the power or the presence of sin, and then it will one day set us free from the presence of sin. Okay? Now we'll pick, we'll pick up in verse 26, go on down here, look at the, the declaration of his righteousness, and hopefully move, get a little quicker. But I told you we were going to go through this stuff a little slower. Because this stuff is setting the foundation, not only on our justification, but then also in our walk, as we get over in Romans 6, 7 and 8, okay? All right, Dearly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word, and we thank you for who we are in your Son and for all that you've done for us. Give you the praise and the glory for that. In your name we pray.